Welcome to the laboratory's director's session. Um, I'm Rick Trotta. I chair the National Advisory Council for the FLC. And we're a group of uh, executives from a variety of uh, callings from academia, from industry, uh, and from the government uh, who try to help the FLC expand their outreach to their stakeholders. Uh, and for the last 17 years, we've sponsored this uh, Laboratory Director of the Year Award. And this year we had, and the competition has been getting more and more fierce. This year we had eight really outstanding nominations, and one of them really stood out above the rest. And that was Dr. Philip Bercanti, director of the Army Research Laboratory. Um, so he is going to give a, uh, a briefing. Sometimes we've had panel discussions, and uh, then we don't have uh, a single briefer. Today we have one award. Um, Dr. Bercanti will have some view graphs. But uh, before I introduce him, I wanted to recognize some of the National Advisory Council members that are in the audience. And could you please stand? And when I say a name, just raise your arm and people will know you. They'll be around for the next week. So Dick Paul and Robert Hurd, could you please stand up for a second? And David Cagle and Kathleen Robertson and Jim Zarzicki. Jim was a neighbor of yours as director of Edgewood for a long time. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just read the bio because that I don't <laughs> try to recall. Um, just a brief bio. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Philip Perconti, the 2018 Laboratory Director of the Year, uh, assumed command of the Army Research Laboratory in 2016. ARL is the Army's premier laboratory for basic and applied research and analysis. ARL conducts research and analysis in weapons and materials, sensors and electron devices, computational and information sciences, human research and engineering, vehicle technology, and survivability and lethality analysis. ARL's Army Research Office executes the Army's extramural basic research program in scientific and engineering disciplines. The laboratory consists of approximately 2,000 civilian and military employees with an annual budget of over $1 billion. Prior to this, Dr. Perconti served as the Director of Sensors and Electron Devices Directorate of the ARL. He was responsible for leading and transitioning the Army's primary and basic and applied research programs in sensors, electronics, sensor information processing, and power and energy technologies. In addition, he led ARL's s and campaign for materials research. His duties included operation of unique electronics and photonics materials fabrication and characterization facilities that enable world-class Army-relevant component research and development. He was also responsible for planning and executing and balancing mission and customer program needs to ensure science and technology dominance in the Army. Now it's my pleasure to turn this session over to Dr. Percanti, who will provide an overview of the Army Research Lab, Open Campus Initiative, and his thoughts on the need to rapidly accelerate technology in the field for soldiers' requirements. We're gonna save a few minutes at the end for questions. So with that, Dr. Percanti, my pleasure to put it over you. Thank you. Well, good, a good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to know, want to say thanks to the FLC and to the members to uh, for this award. It's really, it's really, truly a great honor, and I'm delighted to be here. I didn't realize when I accepted the award that I was going to have to talk for 50 minutes, but that was <laughs> that's the price you got to pay. 
And I also want to thank my fellow directors on the director's panel. Oh, what happened to them? They must be out visiting the Liberty Bell or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to spend some time with you talking about um, a few ideas and to, and to maybe unpack a few things uh, that we talk about a lot in this community, but really to unpack it from a, di a laboratory director's perspective. You know, uh, the mission of the Army Research Laboratory, we're the corporate lab for the Army under the Research and Development Engineering Command. But our mission is discovery, innovation, and transition of science and technology to ensure dominant strategic land power for the United States. And as such, we're the premier laboratory in the country, and I would argue in the world, for land forces. Now, I bring that statement up because there's a lot in that statement. There's a lot of words that I think every one of us may have a different idea of what they mean, like discovery, like innovation. I understand that's a big word in this conference, right? Like transition, I think another big word for this community. So I would like to share with you some thoughts about those words, maybe unpack them a little bit, and then relate them to what we do in the foundational research for the Army, and then more importantly, share with you some ideas about how we really get after serving the warfighter to our best potential, and then focus the research that we do, perhaps most importantly, on outcomes that we can deliver trans tangible, excuse me, results to the soldiers that need them in the quickest time possible. That's what we've set out to do in the Army Research Laboratory, and those are the few things that, that I'll share with you. So here's this first word, discovery. My scientists and engineers, when you tell them, you ask them what they do, some of them will say, well, they do basic research. They, they do discovery. And anyone who is in the sciences has a very specific understanding of what that really means, right? When you think about basic science as trained scientists and engineers, oftentimes we relate it to scientific inquiry, right? We make an observation of the physical world. We develop a model around that observation. We perform experiments to validate that model. We form a thesis around that model. Perhaps we update our model based on our experimentation, and we develop a fundamental understanding of the physics of the natural phenomena. And then we take that understanding and we use it to make predictions about the next great advance or something else that's going to happen as a function of our model. When you talk to a scientist, that's the model they have in their head about discovery. It's a long view. It takes time to do science. Science is hard. That's what they'll tell you, right? So where is this in the context of discovery, innovation, and transition if in a scientist's mind, what I'm really doing is studying the natural world and developing a model to essentially get to improve our understanding of that model. Well, it's rooted in what is really a traditional academic model, where you take an idea, and as a scientist, you're trained when you get your PhD and often when you get your postdoc. You're trained to think from an academic point of view, and that idea has to translate into a discovery that then can be published. And it's those publications that often matter the most to scientists and engineers who are performing basic research. It's the model that's set up in our academic institutions. Everyone here has heard publish or perish. If you don't publish, you don't get tenure, right? Now bring that model into a defense laboratory where the mission of that laboratory is not to be a university, but to deliver outcomes and impact 
to the warfighter to solve problems that are impacting the United States, that are impacting our soldiers, and that can provide new capability to the soldiers of the future. There's a natural tension between publishing in an academic sense and providing use-inspired research to solve problems and to get after gaps in our understanding of what future capabilities look like. And we've done this to ourselves intentionally because this is the way we measure performance in basic research laboratories. Every one of, and some of my researchers are here today, you ask them how many papers they're being told they have to publish for their next pay for performance in, in increase, for the next bonus. We drill it into them. I argue that this is problematic for people in our business because it sets us up for the long view, which is very important. But I will, I will never forget my own research uh, advisor, whom I love to death, he's a dear friend. He said to me, Phil, before you graduate, you must put another brick in the scientific wall of knowledge. And I put like four or five bricks in, and I was still working for him. And finally I said, you know, I've, I've had it, I'm done. I need to graduate. And he said, okay, you've, you've sort of built a row of bricks, you can graduate. But think about that for a minute, right? So if that's your raison d'etre, if that's what you're really focused on, you don't tend to think about the engineering that's required to take a discovery, to take something brand new and apply it to something useful. You write your publication, uh, if, you, if it's a great discovery, hopefully you'll get it into science and it will be heavily cited and you can call yourself a success. But you never really think about what's next or how can I take advantage of this. Now I'm gonna speak in generality because I wanna drive a point because I think our society has changed uh, in, in a good way. However, what folks my age and those who are in senior research positions across this country, often in defense laboratories, still tend to think this way, that they need to put another brick in the scientific wall of knowledge, and that's good enough. And I'd like to change their opinions as well, not just the, the folks that are coming out of school today. So that's my case. So when you have the long view as a scientist, this is kind of what happens. Here's a real scientist, right? Oh, bother, looks like we miscalculated one of the dilution steps. Don't worry, we can do it again tomorrow. Yawn, I'm going to bed, right? When you have time, when you, when you think about the future, because we say, many of our scientists say, we're worried about the army of 2050. So we have time, we'll get to it tomorrow. That is something we have to consider as a model that has to be changed. So what we really want to do is to have our best and brightest, those who understand science and those who understand how to make true discoveries, how can they have a long view but understand where their next step is in the direction or the path for that long view? And always take advantage of the fact that we've got a great discovery. This is something we need to get out as quickly as possible. Even though we're focused on the long view, if we see a breakthrough or if we see a discovery that happens today or tomorrow, we need to do everything that we possibly can to exploit it as quickly as we can, to get it out into the hands of warfighters as quickly as we can. That is the model we are trying to instill at the Army Research Laboratory. And some might say that's innovation, right? What do we mean by innovation? Another word we should unpack a little bit from my perspective. So innovation comes in two forms. First of all, innovation is not invention, right? People have invented all kinds of things, I'm sure this community knows that, that have never been used. You've got a pile of patents this high, and no one has ever put them into practice. That's invention. Many inventions do get put into practice, which, which is really, in my view, innovation, which is taking breakthroughs, <coughs> taking discoveries, 
and combining them in ways that have never been combined before to come up with new capability in a tangible way, something that actually provides a useful function to a soldier or society. And innovation is, a, is an interesting thing, right? We talk about it all the time. We want to have as much diversity of thought. We want to have many, many different skill sets that come to the table because problems are so complex today that innovation has to be multidisciplinary if we're really going to solve the challenging problems that are out in front of us. It comes in many, many flavors, but at the end of it, innovation has to be about delivering tangible outcomes that people can take advantage of. And from my perspective, it comes in two flavors. There's the disruptive innovation, and then there's the incremental innovation. And I will argue to you that most of what we do in this country today is incremental innovation. Because we take what's already known, we take what's in the textbooks today, we do design, we might think of new ideas that are coming from other well-established principles, we bring them together and we increment on them. We build one after the other after the other. But what we really need is disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation comes from understanding where breakthroughs occur and how to best exploit breakthroughs in discovery quickly. So here's a great example. I want to talk about disruptive and incremental innovation in the form of helmets, something the Army cares a great, great, great deal about. So here's the M1 steel pod. It's, it's, it's made from Hatterfield steel. It was actually Hatterfield steel. It's Mangaloy. Uh, it was invented in the uh, late eight, 19th century. Uh, it was, you know, the Doughboy hat. The, the Tommy hats of World War I were Hatfield steel. We used Hatfield steel. We actually put it into production in this form. This is actually a Vietnam era picture, but we actually put Hatfield steel on our soldiers' heads in 1942. You might remember those old World War II movies, if you ever watched the Pearl Harbor movie, they were still wearing the doughboy hats, right? And all of a sudden, we shifted over to these helmets. Well, the thing about Hadfield Steel, why did we put helmets on our heads in the first place, was not to worry about bullets, it was to worry about fragmentation, right? To protect ourselves from air bursts and fragmenting explosives and things like that. This was a disruption because it really did solve the fragmentation problem, but it did not solve a ballistic problem. I know, by the way, it weighs three and a half pounds. It's quite innovative because there's a web system in there, so the U.S. only built one size helmet, unlike the Germans who had many, many different uh, sizes. We only had one, and you changed your liner. Very innovative. But the real disruption was to take this Hadfield steel and put it into this form that you see it here. So, again, incremental, right? Um, now, cycle ahead 40 years, 40 years of discovery and some incremental work. We wore that M1 helmet until 1983. And that was when the Army brought its first Kevlar helmet into production and put it uh, into the field. Now, of course, we all know Kevlar, invented by DuPont, was a great breakthrough, a great discovery that happened by accident, right? The strength to weight ratio of a Kevlar fiber is about 3x that of a constituent size part of steel, or 5x, I'm sorry. So when you think about weaving Kevlar into a protective system, this was a great disruption, right? It caused unprecedented protection from fragmentation, a little bit of ballistic protection, but at a much lighter weight. But it took us 40 years to get there. So, big, big disruption in S&T and in manufacturing for helmets. So now what happens? We go another 20 years of incrementally improving high tensile strength to weight fiber, Kevlar, Aramid, Tuaron, all of these are incremental improvements, incremental innovations that provide some additional level of protection and some improvement in weight. But again, we're building on the 
BRICS and the scientific discoveries that have already put, been put in place, and we're incrementally improving performance. Another 20 years go by. So now, it's 2012, and finally, while all of these incremental improvements are going on, in the tech base, in the foundational research, in the Army Research Laboratory, in the universities that we partner with, we're working on, excuse me, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, which is not only a very high strength-to-weight fiber, but it also has to change, it changes the manufacturing process from thermal set to thermal plastic, which is a, a much more robust manufacturing process and much less cost. Another real disruption, but it took us to 2012 to get there. And finally, that system is cut in and fielded. It is the first helmet that is not only lightweight, can provide uh, fragmentation protection, but is also qualified for ballistic protection. So finally, we've gone from 1942 to 2012, and now we can stop bullets, small arms. This is a major disruption in our ability to protect our soldiers. So the question is, why did it take us so long? And we continue to, in to innovate now, but again, incrementally. So in 2017, the Army fielded the Generation 2 Advanced Combat Helmet, which is, again, a, a weight reduction and some improvement in protection, uh, which will probably last us for a good long time to come. And again, this is the ultimate in performance at the lowest weight and the lowest cost that we can do in ultra-high molecular <laughs> weight polyethylene. So in the tech base today, however, there is work going on in ARL and in other places to think about now other forms of protection material, particularly in the 2D protection material space. How do we exploit novel 2Ds like graphene kinds of structures to again reduce the weight but increase the strength? That will be the next disruption and it will come out of the foundational research community. So, I posit to you that this timeline, while it has helped us and gotten us to be the best country in the world, in my opinion, in this century, it is not going far enough. So we have got to understand how to increase our ability to not only do discovery, but then take those discoveries and breakthroughs and push them into, dis into the disruptive in innovation space as quickly as possible and then transition it as quickly as possible. We know how to do this because we did it during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. And here's a great example of that. In 2004, when we showed up in Iraq in canvas-coated Humvees, I don't know what we were thinking, they don't stop bullets. So we're driving around in urban environments in, in, Iraq, in Iraq, and we suddenly realize we need to armor up our Humvees. So the chemistries that were being worked on in foundational science for armor, composite materials that have to be lightweight, because if you think about trying to armor protect a Humvee, you, you're adding all of this additional weight in the kit that you're putting on. It still has to be able to, to maneuver. Right? So you need a lightweight, strong, solid, low-cost applique that can be put on existing platforms. We did that in 2004. So what happens? Okay, we are well protected against small arms. Well, IEDs show up. We are not protected against IEDs and Humvees. Go figure. But this community did exactly what it needed to do. It took the chemistries and our understanding of blast and fragmentation and composite material and delivered kits for the Humvee in the inner, what's called the interim frag kit, which gave us some protection against explosively formed projectiles and some underbody protection. But of course, that was not enough. And out of that whole exercise in 2008, came the MRAP program, which I'm sure many of you know about, which if it weren't for Secretary Robert Gates, never really would have happened because it took leadership at that level and it took 
sufficient funding at that level to provide this kind of protection in the numbers that were needed for our forces downrange in this timeline. But you look at this. Look at this protection problem. From 2004 to 2008, four years, with a very similar, very complex technology base from what I just described to you in helmet protection. Four years. So we know how to do this as a community. Now, how do we go about doing it? That's the question. What about today's war? What I just gave you were two examples of hardware, of materiel. But we know today's fight, it's an information fight. We have to move at the speed of the fight. And if those of you don't get the pun, it's really about the speed of light. We have to be able to move at that speed because things like electronic warfare, things like artificial intelligence, and certainly things like offensive and defensive cyber are moving at such a rapid pace, there is no way the traditional model can keep up. No way. So how do we fix that? We have to come together as a community to do so. Make no mistake, this country is in an information war. So I argue that we ought to have a sense of urgency in our community, similar to the sense of urgency that we had during OEF and OIF to combat this issue. What do we do about it? So that gets to transition. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the Army Research Laboratory's model for trying to accelerate this fundamental research, this discovery, this disruptive innovation, to get it out as fast as possible. And the way we want to do that is through close, early collaboration with all of our partners to really reach these foundational capabilities. I view this very much like Kevlar, a strand of fiber. ARL has a fairly strong strength to weight ratio. But we will never be as strong if we don't include our partners, our warfighter partners, our academic partners, and our industrial partners early on, from the onset of research. This is a challenge, but it's absolutely needed. Your community in particular, you should be engaged early on, as soon as possible with the scientists and engineers that are performing this basic and foundational work. So how do you do it, right? Because it's a challenge. We have resource constraints. We're, we're not located in the same area, et cetera, et cetera. We have other things we want to bring to the value proposition, et cetera, et cetera. How do you do it? My argument is the way you do it is you have to develop a partnership. And partnerships are developed through proximity, because only when we're with each other do we begin to trust each other. And in my, my, my point of view is you don't have true collaboration. You don't form true partnerships. In other words, true partnerships are I succeed if you succeed, and oh, we're going to fail together, and we're all vested into the same problem space. Even though each one of us has a different value proposition, we can see the value that our, our partners have and what they bring to the table. And we want to work with them closely because we trust them. That is what we're trying to do in ARL. And that's what we call open campus. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute. But what I want to show you first is where the Army is going under what we call the Army Futures Command, which will be stood up here very soon. In that model, there is a strong understanding, particularly when you talk about war fighting and new concepts for the future, that you cannot develop new war fighting concepts if you don't have a good understanding of the technology that's available, of the uncertainty associated with technology, and most importantly, of the risk associated with technology. It's S&T's job to reduce the uncertainty and to provide warfighters with options with measurable risk 
that they can make assessments about where new concepts can come from and how quickly they will emerge and what the cost of those concepts will be. So it's a tight connection, again, close proximity with the combat developers, with the people who develop the concepts for the next fight. The other partnership has to be in what we call the operational environment. In other words, what is the threat that the United States faces today and in the future? Because so much of what a laboratory like the Army Research Laboratory has to do is to focus its research on threat-based technologies, to counter the threat, to get out in front of the threat, to bring technologies to bear that will continue to provide us overmatch. This triad is coming closer together under the Army Futures Command, and I am a big supporter of this. No longer do I have to go out and chase a requirement. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Because I've got combat developers sitting side by side with me, and they're asking me questions about, you know, is this AI thing, is that real? You know, and what are we really going to do with AI, Phil? You know, those questions are so powerful because, they, again, they provide the community with this ability to understand the uncertainty in technology, understand where the risks are, and then understand how we can provide decision makers with the ability to make informed decisions where they understand the costs associated. Very, very powerful. But again, it's proximity that is going to make this work, and it's trust that's going to make this work. So why do I bring this up? Because I think what's missing from this model is the tech transfer community. You should not be left out of this conversation. Because it's this community that has to figure out where joint patents are most useful. It's going to help us form cooperative research and development agreements, which are extraordinarily important in the open campus model. It's going to help us understand how can we best exploit other transaction agreements. PIAs are another one in here, sorry. Another important one, right? The tech transfer community has to be part of this. What I tell my staff, and again, when you're trained sort of in the classical academic model, there is another model at our universities that exists that is much more powerful and much more effective and actually, I would say, is predominant, particularly in today's engineering universities. And that's this model of academic entrepreneurship. I think you heard from one of our academic entrepreneurs in the previous session today. That's the model that we are trying to encourage at ARL. Here's a breakthrough. How do I exploit it? Who do I need to work with to get it out? How can I transition it either through postdocs or students that come into my laboratory where they can then be ambassadors for my technology? How do I make that happen? Most scientists don't know how to do it. That's where you come in. You can help with this model. It is a very powerful model. But you have to be willing to change the way you think about the job that you do. You have to be much more aggressive. You don't want to wait for, for patent applications to be thrown over the transom. You don't want to wait for industrial partners to contact you to understand a license or to understand opportunities for a license. You need to be aggressive. You need to go into the laboratories. You need to say to the community, what you got? What can I exploit? Have you heard about this company? Do you understand this opportunity? Let me help you. Let me help you, Dr. Mr. Scientist, Ms. Scientist. Because we can help you transition faster. And we can work on outcomes. And that's what's most important. It's not to publish. It's not to build your CV. It's not even necessarily to develop some fundamental understanding of a natural observation. Not for us. We're the Army Research Laboratory. We work for the United States soldier. That's what we do. And I tell my staff, if you want to be at a university, go. Go. Because the culture 
that we are trying to build is one of academic entrepreneurship. That's the way you change the model. That's the way you go from 40 years to four. And it takes all of us. This is about an ecosystem. We want to put ourselves at the center of the ecosystem where we can leverage not only our resources, but our partners' resources, their infrastructure, their talent, their ideas. And they can leverage ours. It's not about he, who, he or she who has the most toys wins anymore. It's about how do you get at the center of the most toys so that you can exploit the ecosystem. That's really what we're after. And that's what Open Campus is about. So ARL has uh, locations across the country uh, where we are our traditional sites. We have about uh, 2,000 people in Maryland, both at Aberdeen and Adelphi. The Army Research Office is in North Carolina. We have our simulation and training people down in Florida and Orlando. And we have a contingent uh, at White Sands Missile Range that do analysis and computational information science. That's our traditional space. And we started with this open campus concept about four years ago, where we wanted to open up our research laboratories to allow our partners access to not only our people, but to our facilities. And people often got, I know senior leadership in the Army got nervous when we said, we're going to have open campus. And they were like, what do you mean you're going to open up a federal installation? What you guys, what about physical security? What about operational security? You got to solve those problems first before you can bring anybody in. Any of you who, who have dealt with foreign, foreign I, I stopped calling people foreign nationals. They're really international collaborators. Right? Anytime we try to bring a collaborator in who might be uh, from a different country, everyone knows the, the difficulty that, that can uh, occur. So uh, to, re to uh, mitigate the risk for Army leadership, first thing we had to do was put in place infrastructure to make sure that we knew where all of our partners were in our open campus space. And it's not every space in our laboratory is open, but there are specific areas where once our partners come in, they can use our facilities, they have access to our staff, they can use our infrastructure, we're incubating uh, small companies. You know, all of that, we're bringing students in, we're bringing professors in, all of this in an open, open way. And we started in Adelphi, we brought it to Aberdeen, and now we're bringing it across the country. And there's a couple of things that make this work. I just want to really highlight one, which is cooperative research and development agreements, which is very important. And this community has such a vital role to play in cooperative research and development agreements. So what we've done, I, you know, I, just a little backstory, right? So if, if you are a, a principal investigator and you go to a conference, and you meet someone who you want to collaborate with. The first thing you have to do if you're, if you're a government researcher is get a cooperative research and development agreement. This can be daunting in many institutions. And it was daunting in ARL for many, many years. Uh, when I showed up at ARL five years ago, I think we had maybe 15 cooperative research and development agreements across the whole laboratory. And this is a laboratory of 3,000 people. Right, 15. The challenge has always been these peer-to-peer -peer cooperative research and development agreements take too long to get in place. Sometimes six months, some t sometimes a year. And if you're in that space, particularly if you're a professor and you're a wor world-class professor, you don't want to wait that long to collaborate. Again, it goes back to this time question. Right? So our solution to that problem was to put in place cooperative research and development agreements that are overarching, that are signed at the institution level. Once that cooperative research and development agreement is in place, the IP has been pre-negotiated, all of the other illities have been negotiated. Now, if you and I meet at a conference and we want to work together, all we have to do is write a two-page joint statement of work. And it is very quick. It's gotten so much traction, I think we have to hire more people because we can't manage the, 
the backlog of cooperative research and development agreements that are coming in. So what does it mean? So I have one cooperative research and development agreement with the entire University of Texas system. system. One with the entire university, I'm sorry, Texas A&M system, right? Just about every major research university who we feel uh, we need to uh, co collaborate with has signed one of these institutional craters. I tried to get one with the entire University of California system, but it turns out there's more bureaucracy in that system than there is in the federal government. So we couldn't do it. We had to have cooperative research and development agreements with the individual campuses. But even still, we have one agreement with each one. This has been a major, major innovation, disruptive innovation in the CRADA space, in my opinion. And we begin to leverage this throughout our portfolio. And you can see the benefits. So just this year alone, it's $40 million that's in kind. So it's $80 million of research when we bring our $40 million to the table. Over the last four and a half years, about $83 million in in-kind, so double that. And that's the, the level of uh, collaboration and in-kind research that's occurring. And you can go down the list and you can see the number of active creators, projects, uh, the number of visitors that we've co had come into our institution and have, uh, we've sent people to our space, et cetera. All of this is stemming from this open campus arrangement. So we took it a step further because, again, it's very easy as a defense laboratory because you're worried about uh, physical security and you're worried about perhaps the cost of putting people in other organizations and the like. It's very easy to sort of put up a roadblock and become cloistered and not want to leave your domain in Maryland. But there was a realization about four years ago that not everybody, although Maryland's a beautiful state, the crabs are wonderful, although I don't really like crabs, but my wife loves them. Um, not everybody wants to live in Aberdeen. So, so when you think about today's fight, particularly cyber, particularly artificial intelligence and machine learning, to attract those folks to Aberdeen, it's extraordinarily hard. Now, everybody's up for a good problem, and there are many, many young people in this country who want to serve in other ways besides wearing a uniform, and oftentimes that attracts them to Aberdeen. But our argument was, let's go to where the innovation is occurring. Let's go to where the talent resides, and let's hire regionally. So that's what we've done. We've stood up a laboratory in California at USC, uh, at the Institute for Creative Technology. We have about 30 people there. We have a laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin. We have a laboratory at the University of Chicago. And we just opened our newest one at Northeastern University. And you know, because we're the Army and we're not very creative, we call them ARL West, ARL South, ARL Central, and ARL Northeast. But this model really works because what, it, again, it's about proximity and it's about trust and it's about collaboration. So what we do is we go in, we, we form relationships with professors. Those professors have students. Those students start to work for us. Those professors start to work for us. We get postdocs. All of a sudden, we have a pool of experts in an area that's critical to the United States working for us. And we bring our culture out there so they kind of understand the Army a little bit. And you'd be surprised, maybe not, how hard it is to really understand the Army and who to go to even, right? This is really starting to take hold. So much so that, and I don't want to take credit for this, but the Army Futures Command has decided to move its headquarters into one of the innovation hubs across the country rather than keeping it in, in the DC National Capital Region because they understand the value of being in a region where there's innovation that you need and being close by that you can leverage it. That's really the whole purpose of this, is to get to the level of innovation, get the proximity, get the trust, establish the ecosystem, and accelerate 
the transition. Maybe this is the real model. You know, if you look at the movie scientist, run for your lives, the dilutions are all wrong. It's going to blow, right? How many movies have you watched? I know it's not that funny, but it makes a point. <laughs> it makes a point. I think we have to be somewhere in between there. But we've got to get our scientists and our engineers and our administrative professionals, our war fighters, our industry partners, our university partners, and this community in the same ecosystem. And then I think we'll have some. Because at the end of the day, this goes back to my, what you didn't say about me, is I spent 20 years of performing research on night vision technology, so it's always good for me to go home. But this is really what it's about, to accelerate the discovery, to get the innovation through collaboration and the transition. And it's about open, collaborative work. And when we need to take it behind closed doors, we know enough when to do that, right? Because this is foundational work. That's the key difference, is to understand what you can, where you can collaborate, where it makes sense to be open, and where it doesn't. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Yes. So thank you very much for your talk. Very inspiring what you and your team have been able to do. Can you share a little bit about the size of those open campus sites relative to Aberdeen? Oh, they're much smaller. So the goal is, is to get 10 to 15 percent of our workforce someplace else, and I'd like to get 10 to 15 percent of other people's folks in our facilities. So it's about 40 to 50 people within each region. That's probably where we'll level, level off that. Yeah. Thank you. But that's the game. That's the goal. And I also want to put people in, you know, in a partner organization. So what I didn't, what what I showed you, were where our flagpoles are. So in other words, that's our headquarters. But if you think about California, we actually have staff at UC Santa Barbara. We have staff at UC Irvine. In Texas, we have staff you know, all across the system. In UT El Paso, um, we have people at Texas A&M, uh, people at uh, North Texas, I think, as well. And so that, that's the model. And then in the Northeast as well, um, our flagpole is at Northeastern University. We already have people at MIT and some other locations. And then in Chicago, we just uh, stood up a, a, a what, what's known as a um, collaborative research alliance on the Internet of Battlefield things, what we call it's IoT related, software related. That'll be headquartered out of the Chicago area. Uh, UC, University of Chicago, Illinois, um, Urbana-Champaign is actually moving into the Chicago area. So we're gonna headquarter headquarter that out of the Chicago area. But, so that's, that's kind of the model. So about 200 people across the country. We also have people internationally, but they're small groups. Uh, and then we'd like to get 200 people in to our own facility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Do you see a time down the road where other federal laboratories, whether D or D or other agencies, will team with your open campuses, physically on site? Uh, I hope so. Uh, we have talked um, quite a bit with UT San Antonio, uh, particularly in the cyberspace, where there will probably be a joint facility there that'll be leveraged across not only the Department of Defense, but some other government uh, labs. That's probably the, the one that's closest. And I keep, I keep extending invitations to my colleagues at AFRL and uh, at NRL. <laughs> if they wanna put people in those facilities, they're welcome to do so whenever they want. They're interested, they're thinking about it. You know. are, are you having any uh, institutional creators in the industry? We have, uh, yeah, we have creators. Uh, again, the goal is overarching creators. Yeah. So I have one creator with all of Lockheed Martin, if you can imagine that, uh, which is proving <laughs> to be very, very fruitful, uh, particularly with the Advanced Technology Laboratory. We're, we're starting to exchange people now. We've actually had Lockheed Martin on site for over a year, 
We're going to put several of our people now in their facilities. Uh, I'm about to sign one with Raytheon here in the next uh, mm -hmm. several months, all of Raytheon. Right? So you can imagine, um, and there, there, there are many smaller ones. If you want to, we'll give you the list. The Tom Mulkin is he's in charge of the list. <laughs> That, you know, that's, it's a great question. So every partner has their own value proposition. So I can't necessarily answer that question for partners. Some of them see great ideas, like was talked about today. Many of them uh, just want to know where the problems are. What's important in the Army? And what are you guys working on? And how can I understand my core competency and how it relates to the problems of the Army? Many of them see great value in just that. Uh, so, but, it, but it varies from company to company. And what I say is, and I told my staff this too, right? Don't sign a creative if you don't mean it. If you're not willing to really collaborate, then don't do it because I don't really care about numbers. I care about outcomes. Deming said a long time ago, what you measure is what gets done. So if all we're going to do is count creators, we're measuring the wrong thing. Same thing with Pat. We have a cooperative research and development agreement that outlines personnel exchanges. <laughs> and, and the That's purpose simple. of the personnel exchanges? Research, collaborative research. So one thing that you have to, okay, so a slight subtlety, right? So this is foundational work. This is all pre-competitive. When you start talking about programs of record and requests <laughs> for proposals and DOD 5000 kicks in, we're, we're done. But this is collaborative, pre-competitive work. Yes, yes. So, so all of the above. So we have a regional lead who's a senior person that sort of re direct report to me. It's that important to, to stand it up. Well, all, sometimes we'll bring senior scientists to that location and they'll just work out of there. Uh, sometimes we'll recruit regionally. We want to bring some of our culture, not all of it, some of it, out to these regions. So that model works really well. The other thing we do is... Um, just like over the summer, I'll send 15 mentors out to these universities and we'll work with students for the summer, the entire summer. And it's, that's a great model because you get, I can't tell you the number of young students who have come up to me and said, I had no idea you guys were working on this. Mm -hmm. This is so cool. And then we say, well, you know, you're never going to get rich, right? You're not, it's, we're not Google. Right? You're never going to get rich. But man, you're going to work on some really cool, interesting problems. And often, you know, my colleagues, some of my colleagues at Google, whom I've talked to, they're not really my colleagues, but people I know who want to criticize will say, well, Google has interesting problems too. <laughs> so they'll just come to work for us. But well, yeah, okay, that's true. They will come to work for you until they understand that for the next 10 years, all they're going to do is this. Right? We have a different view. You know, for us, it's always about growing leaders and getting people to take on a different vantage point and uh, to be about service. That's the goal. And uh, there are many, many people, young, young people in this country, who want to serve in ways other than wearing a uniform. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious because our lab works more in applied <laughs> So it comes, it comes from, oftentimes it comes from the VP of research. 
uh, believe it or not. Um, and the, again, it's what's the value proposition, right? So if you look at Northeastern University, where we just stood up our, our headquarters, they have a campus that they very much want to be focused on defense-related research, particularly in cyber and, and in other areas. They were falling over backwards to get us to come be part of that campus for their own reasons. You know, what they see is opportunity for new business, for new problem sets, uh, to see, you know, ultimately the value proposition is for sponsored research. But it's not about money for, from, from the Army. Because we always say, look, um, we're going to be friends first. We're going to trust one another. And then maybe, this is the Brooklyn, and then maybe we'll <laughs> talk about money. But it's not until we establish these relationships. And then, once we have those relationships in place, what's, often, what's starting to occur now is there are joint, a lot of joint grants, research activities are being worked up uh, for, for other people's money. And that's becoming more and more successful. And I'm not opposed to making investments either. Like, I capitalized the laboratory in, in the biospace in Texas because I knew I was going to have staff down there. So, you know, this is kind of the, the in kind. Well, I'm going to stand up a lab down there. Uh, I'm going to put some additive manufacturing equipment down there. Your students and your professors can take advantage of that. And um, in kind for that, we get facilities, we get infrastructure, we get access. That's the model. It's, it's more of a barter system kind of a model, really. But it is working very effectively. Sir? You, know, you mentioned that we're in an information war, and there's a natural tension between the, uh, the publisher parish and the mentality of academia and the It, it, it's, it's always a question. And again, so this is, when you think about the value proposition, and you think about forming partnerships, and it's like I said earlier, don't do it if you're not interested. So what we're finding is we're, we're, we're fostering collaboration with professors who want to work with us. So there's no, there's no question about this, this discussion. When can I publish? When can I publish? We understand very early on, in, particularly in the foundational space, what's publishable and what we're going to keep you know, out of the public eye. And because it's a, it's a coalition of the willing, we have not really run across a problem yet. That's not to say we won't at some point. But. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll tell you the biggest issue we face is kind of funny. We, uh, we went to Israel, and it was a GovGov, mill-mill thing. And, um, you know, they were touring us around, and we went to Ben-Gurion University, and there was some wor work going on at Ben-Gurion that we very much wanted to collaborate on. It's in the quantum information sciences space. So my, my former boss, who's now the DASA, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Research, Tom Russell, he and I looked at each other and he went, we got to have a crater with Ben-Gurion. And the Israeli Ministry of Defense went, what? You can't, you can't do that. You have to work through us. You have to work mill-mill. And we sat, right, Tom? We sat, we talked about it. We convinced them. I said, why not? Let's just, <laughs> let's just have a crater. This is university to the research lab. We don't need mill mill for this. And they agreed. So that was the biggest hurdle, was to get the MOD to understand that this was in their best interest, too. So now we have craters. We have a crater with Ben Gurion, 10 internationals. But again, you know, people want to count numbers. And, I, and I'll tell you again that, for me, it's not a numbers thing. It's a quality and an outcome-driven measure. So I don't want to have 100 international craters if we're never going to use them. It starts with the idea. It starts with the work. And then you build upon it from there.
I don't know. I, I'm happy to. I, I'm happy to allow my, you know, Bruce Stanley and I talk all the time, and I am happy to do whatever I can for NRL and for AFR. Yeah, of course, it's a job for DOD, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've had many conversations, I've had several conversations with DOE, lab directors, AFRL, NRL. You know, I get asked similar questions. Um, much of it has to do with physical security and OPSEC. And I think, I think Congress and I think uh, the individual agencies, if they were to sort of just look at this, they, they could figure out a way to do it because Congress has given us the authorities to do it. And Congress has been extraordinarily supportive through the partnership with DOD. So, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I, w I appreciate being, having an opportunity to tell people and to tell this community, but again, I'm Army. And I want this to work for the Army. So, so my time, as the leader of the Army Research Laboratory, is to ensure that we're getting it right, we're measuring the right things. And most importantly, the barriers to collaboration for the staff has to come way down. And you know, I, I'll be the first to admit, we don't do that as well as we should. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that we're trying to do now. So getting our business processes right, Getting, getting the decision making down to the lowest level, empowering as many of the, as a, the mid level managers as possible so that they can lower the barriers to innovation and discovery to the greatest extent we can. And that is a daily challenge. Yes? If I, if I might, I've been teaching the trade workshop at the FLC for about nine years. This is the first lab director who really he understands how flexible the law is. You're to be congratulated. Thanks. And it is the model. Any agency can do that. All they have to do is make the decision uh, to, to not be so risk adverse, hire all their lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, so look, I've learned, I've, you know, I've been in this, I may not look it, right, honey? But my <laughs> wife is here. She's loving my wife. Um, I may not look it, but I've been in this business for a long time. I have learned a lot over the last five years or so about the way senior leaders at the highest levels think, right? Um, for them, they're the decision makers. For them, it's about assessing the risk. Give me what I need to make an informed decision. It's my job as the leader to assess whether or not that risk is acceptable for me mm -hmm. to make a command decision. If you put that in front of the leadership, nine out of 10 of them will assume you are doing the right thing because you're giving them the information. It's informed. It's knowledgeable. You're an expert in your field. You're giving them the information to make an informed decision based on the risk that they see in front of them. And that is very, very important. The other thing I've learned is, and this is not uh, in any way pejorative to the attorneys in the room, 
But attorneys are advisors. Their job is to advise the leadership and to inform them of the risk associated with the decisions that they're about to make. It is not to say no. <laughs> so if you have attorneys who think that way and understand this model and are delivering insightful advice in a way that leaders can interpret it effectively, then you will get informed decisions by leaders who I don't believe are the, the four stars in this country didn't get where they are by being risk adverse. That's what I believe. But, but if you don't explain it to them and you don't lay out the risk for them, then how can they make an informed decision? And that's when you get pushback. They can say no, right? It's their decision. That's what it means to be a commander. I've learned this very recently. <laughs> My boss tells me this all the time. <clears throat> and we all have a boss, right? Well, I'm delighted that you got a good idea of why Dr. Percanti got this award. <laughs> all right. So I, I Thanks very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.